I'm Linda van Tilburg for Biz News, and I have John Jacobson with me. He's the CEO and co-founder of Omniscient. They are a data company, if I'm correct, but they have just been nominated as a tech entrepreneur by the World Economic Forum. And John is on his way to China for the summer Davos meeting, if you can call it that. Hi, John, and welcome to Biz News. Hi, Linda. Uh, thanks very much for having me. I'm very good to be here. Well, before we talk about the, the, this nomination, which is great, what exactly does Omnesian do? So um, Omniscient effectively helps businesses to collaborate um, uh, on data. And really, that might seem like, well, why aren't they doing that anyway? Um, and why the, the reason they're not and really struggle is privacy, right? And privacy legislation kind of inhibits the way businesses move data around and share data. Um, and so what we did was we built a platform that solves all the, the fundamental issues around privacy in terms of anonymization, personal information, protects businesses' intellectual property, and then also pr protects them from hacking and breaching. And once we did that, we effectively then you can think of us as a data and analytics business. So there's some key things that we solve for using those principles, and one of them is financial inclusion. And that's why um, we've been included in the in the Summit Davos event and in the Technology Pioneers, because what we are doing with our with our, uh, our retail partners and our banking partners is managing to solve financial inclusion, especially access to credit um, and credit worthiness, um, and solve that at scale by using other data, telco data, shopper data, to actually build predictive credit risk scores. So there's an element of us that's privacy and cryptography, there's an element of us that's data, and there's an element of us that's AI, and that's all packaged into one platform. Oh, I heard the word AI. That's the big buzzword at the moment. So what is no, your no, take? No. So, so, yeah, so AI is like lots of stuff, right? And we're not um, chat GPT. This isn't generative AI. This is very much predictive modeling around being able to solve particular kinds of problems in the market. Um, and so, for instance, credit risk is uses AI um, uh, models to predict out whether somebody's going to be credit worthy. It's very different to what a chat GPT would do, for instance, you know, in terms of um, uh, that would be more based around, um, you know, l like language models and uh, it's very different. Well, you haven't been around a long time. It's just since 2019. So where did the idea come from? What is your background and the that of the other co-founder? So my background is I'm a software engineer. Um, I trained at Rhodes University. I got a BSc in computer science. I then spent most of my career building platforms and solutions. In the early days, I was very involved in... Um, EFT and building EFT systems, uh, RS-232, RS-485 type stuff. Um, spent some of my career in the UK. Spent a chunk of my time in New York with Credit Suisse First Boston. Um, and then I came back to South Africa. And since then, I've effectively been a technology entrepreneur um, with, like most entrepreneurs, some success, some failure. Um, but yeah, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been an interesting road. And then this this platform and this business idea, my partner and I, Anton, kind of both come out of the data world, but um, with very different lenses. I'm a software engineer and I've build, been building data platforms for quite a lot of my career. Um, and Anton came out of the data world, but really in terms of business development and innovating and building data products. And what we realized um, was that when privacy happened, and started being promulgated. GDPR, I think, was promulgated, and then in, in 2016, there was going to there was going to be a sea change. And we'd seen it in the business we'd been operating in, and businesses that we were familiar with, that the way data was being moved around and passed around, that was going to change. If, historically, what a business would do if it wanted to, for instance, access leads. A, a data partner, they'd find a data partner and they would just sell them leads and they get the data. And it's, it's your data, it's my data, and it'd be sitting on somebody's database and not sitting on somebody else's database. There could be a breach or a hack of that data somewhere in that chain of data moving around. And then that data lands up in the market and it lands up being sold over and over again. And you, 
Linda will end up getting a call at two o'clock in the morning asking you if you want funeral insurance. And you and, and, and so privacy kind of came around in my mind for two reasons. One, there was a massive PR um, exercise around the Cambridge Analytica scandal and Facebook combined with the challenges that people were experiencing anyway around usage of data. And there was kind of almost a groundswell of movement that then uh, where the EU and the, and the EU Commission then kind of put together the principles of GDPR. And GDPR as an underlying privacy law has kind of spread um, to many other markets in different forms. South Africa has a version of it called Papier. But if you went to California, there's California Consumer Protection Act, and that's a version of GDPR. And so when we built this platform, we took a bet at the time that GDPR was going to be the prevalent law and that the way we built our tech in line with the law, it needed to do certain things. And one of those things was people's personal information should never leave a business's environment. So how would you solve the problem of allowing businesses to collaborate if the personal information can never leave a business environment because within the law, there's, a, there's an idea of PI, which is personal information, and then there's PII, which is personally identifiable information. If you could solve that problem of anonymizing the PII in such a way, you could then also later on use it for linking different data assets together without ever ever sharing personal information because it's anonymized. And so John becomes X4396, right? But if I shop at a retailer and I go and I also bank and I do various other things, I go to gym, X4396 is actually the common language of all of these different businesses. So they don't know John, but they know this guy who looks like John and has the same character traits as John operates in a certain way. And we kind of built the data ecosystem around that model. So once you could do that and you had this other data that's not PI, not PII, well, that's what you model. And so you start building out, inform, you know, you start building out capability for predicting credit risk or for predicting whether the likelihood that somebody will accept an offer. And you can kind of solve the problem of privacy in two pieces. One, no personal information ever gets shared, and so you can build these models and you can have an individual that you don't know who that is, but would likely want to receive a credit offer. And then later on, you can re-identify that individual with consent. And so those are the two pieces of the law that we effectively program. The privacy side around anonymization, and then bringing consent into play, because consent trumps everything. Who are your customers? Are they South African or are they based all around the world? Um, so predominantly South African and more recently in other markets like Nigeria, um, the UAE, um, and we in the process of now launching into the UK and the USA as well um, and some other markets. And how has the business been growing since 2019? Yeah, no, it's, it's growing at a... <laughs> it's growing um, and... I suppose that's part of the challenge of growing, of, of running a business that grows so quickly is, you know, you're scaling all the time. I mean, the, in this tech startup world, you know, they call it scale up, I suppose. And that's really what happens is you move very quickly from what's called an MVP, which is what we built as MVP, minimum viable product, just to prove that original principle I was explaining was, can I prove the point and the principle that I could collaborate with other businesses without ever sharing any personal information. And we proved that principle. Very quickly, we raised funding with uh, Investec and Nedbank here in South Africa and a, um, uh, a French VC, a uh, Mauritian VC called Compass. Um, and so they were the original investors. We then did a subsequent investment round in 21 and brought some international investors on board. And then we've done, did a, a, a round again last year and we brought in additional investors, including ShopRite um, and the Buffett Group. And, 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 um, and yeah, so we are actually now in the process of doing our Series A investment round um, and, and doing some other things around the business, um, offshoring, offshoring it and various different other pieces of things going on. So, yeah, it's busy. Seems you've got big plans. Yeah, it's always good to have plans, right? So the most important thing is to be able to execute on your plan. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, that for me is the key. You know, there's a lot going on. Our ability to execute and make good decisions determines the future of our business. So, yeah, we kind of I've got a very 
incredibly good executive team, um, you know, which, which frees me up to think more around strategy and, um, and we've got very good advisors, good board. So, I mean, I think the business has got the right people involved in it. Um, and that, you know, obviously that helps me as CEO a hell of a lot. So, but then you've won this prize um, as um, by the World Economic Forum as a tech pioneer. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I think that's huge. It's, it's, it's massive recognition. Um, I think it's also recognition for the work we're doing in financial inclusion. I think we spoke briefly about what this actually means in practice. And if you can start in a country like South Africa, um, you have it's a fairly sophisticated credit economy. Um, I would say, you know, maybe these, the, the credit bureaus who, who globally determine whether the, somebody's right to get credit or not, I mean, is, is probably a way to put it because the decision making and the credit decision is made, the credit bureaus kind of determine that, right? And in their world, they have two kinds of people. They've got thick file and got thin file. And thick file are people that are, and that's just an old term from the days when there wasn't even computers. So the thick file means that there's loads of pages in the file, which tells you that we've got enough information to make a credit decision. For most of emerging markets, I think it's close to 2 billion people globally uh, who don't have access to credit. They would largely be considered financially, uh, you know, they would be financially excluded, but largely they would either be thin file or there just would be no data on them whatsoever. And then the problem becomes, how do you include those people in the credit economy when there's no data? This is typically normally a historical disadvantage in a country like South Africa. It goes way, way back. And so people in the South African economy, in, in previously disadvantaged communities, would have something like a stock fill that they would run with. And that really is based on trust of a very close group of people that know each other well, normally from the same village or area. And there's no interest involved, but it's a, it's, it's a lending system and creates, creates kind of, I suppose, a, um, discipline in the way that money gets spent. And but there isn't actually access into this other world. And if you could tap into that other world, right, which is the credit economy and not in the way that payday lenders do it, which is kind of 50% interest rates on top of that small loan you took, but through the banks. banks. Because the banks themselves are the arbiters of, they are they're heavily regulated. And, and so the interest rate you're going to get from a bank is going to be a hell of a lot better. But the bank is very, very rigorous around credit and offering credit. And so they would normally only offer to the thick files. When we bring alternative data into play, for instance, in a retailer's rewards program, and if that retailer is serving um, low income people, we've already shown there's roughly 8 million additional people in the South African economy could be offered credit. So 8, eight million could, could, could get credit that probably at the moment don't have access to it. Absolutely nothing. They're like they 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 they're out of the game. And now you extrapolate that out into a, and South Africa, as I say, is a fairly sophisticated credit economy where a good thirty to forty percent of people are kind of credit worthy of their thereabouts. Countries like Nigeria, you're talking about fifteen percent of people are credit worthy. When you talk about Egypt, I mean Egypt only thirty percent of the population is banked, you know. So and you think about Kenya and you think about these other markets, and that's where data is incredibly powerful. Data is the key, right? And when people talk about data as a new oil, they kind of, it, it, it's kind of a very blase about talking about what is an incredibly powerful thing if you use it in the right way. And so um, that's what we do is we kind of get businesses with, the, with that kind of data to, part, to participate because actually it's worth their while to do it because they're making good money out of it. But what it's also then doing is it's bringing their data partners like the banks into play. So you could be a retailer or a telco. Your data is predictive of something. In this case, it's predictive of the likelihood of somebody to default or not default um, on a credit loan. And the banks can then use that to say, oh, okay. And that's great for the banks, right? Because they can, I mean, I think in the one exercise we did, we showed that in a personal loans product for a particular bank, they could increase sales by 30%. Right? And that's great for the bank. The bank's increasing sales by 30%. The retailer's making money and the guy who could never get credit is in the credit economy. So it's actually kind of a win-win for everyone. So what's your big dream for this company? The big dream? Mm. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, so so we've got so so we we are we're an ambitious group of people. I think we believe what we're doing here is fairly unique. The recognition from the um, from the, the World Economic Forum tells me that it's that it's it's kind of there thereabouts in terms of of the kinds of um, you know the kinds of technologies they look at that can fundamentally rejig economies and make changes. The, chain, the, the things we're doing around financial inclusion are not a particularly just an African problem, right? I mean, in America, you're talking 50 million people have not have, have, haven't got access to credit. So it's a problem that's, that, that spans right across the globe. And so that's if, well, our ambitions are to become the largest provider of solving the financial inclusion problem um, globally. No. With data. With data, yeah, yeah. with John, data and some and some modelling, <laughs> yeah. and serious modelling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> John Jacobson from Omnesian, thank you so much, and and you're good luck with the prize. I'm, you're going to um, the World Economic Forum in summer, possibly easier than going to Switzerland. Yeah, although I suppose Switzerland's nice if you ski. So. I'm a snowboarder, so that would be fun. But, yeah, I'm going to Tianjin, um, and then I've been invited to the one um, in, in Davos. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about Tianjin. I'm getting to meet some super smart people and, you know, um, that can really help us. Great networking event. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>